break from tradition, I ask you to stand in tribute, but not in silence, rather to celebrate the life of Nelson Mandela with a minute's applause. My second announcement concerns two council employees, one of them being with us this evening. Kevin Jones and Mick Garner both work in our street cleaning team service. We are VIP of the winner in October, but I think their story is worth telling uh, to this wider audience. Mike and Kelvin were working on Walbrook Road when they were approached by a lady in some distress who evidently did not speak English. She managed to say, baby sick, and asked them to go into her house to help. Inside, they found an obvious seriously ill baby. Mike rang an, an, an ambulance and calmly gave the emergency services all the details they needed. The mother's lack of English and the fact that she did not seem to know how to call an emergency services means that Mike and Kelvin's action probably saved the baby's life. They stayed at the house until the ambulance arrived. Mike Gardner is with us this evening, so can I ask all of, all of the members to join me in thanking him and Kelvin, who can't be here, with a round of applause. My last announcement is procedural. Yesterday, we were all circulated minutes, minute ex extracts from last week's audit and accounts committee. Hard copies have now been given to each of you. There is a recommendation within that for council approval, so I intend to take that item as item 9A, as an addition to consideration of cabinet minutes and recommendations. Next item is item five, statement from members of the council cabinet. There are none. Item six, question to the cabinet members from members of the public. We have six questions from our questioners, Keith Birchill, Simon Bacon, Dorothy Skritek, and Paul Chadwick. And I extend them a warm welcome to, to, to each of them. The questions submitted and answers to them have been circulated in advance, and there is now an opportunity for a supplementary question on each one. I must remind questioners the supplementary must be directly related to the initial question and the answer received. Uh, can I call on Mr. Birchell to ask the supplementary question? Thank you, sir, um, and for the answer from Councillor Banwait. My supplementary question is this. Given the importance of combating climate change, what, if any, information did you seek and receive from the landfill operator about the impact that an increase in the amount of brown bin material being sent to their site would have? 
Councillor Bonvid. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for providing the courtesy of providing your uh, supplementary question in writing. I therefore will be providing a, I've got a, a written response here which I'll now read out. The reduction in vehicles has had a positive effect on reducing our carbon footprint. We do, however, encourage residents to compost their garden waste to produce compost that will improve the soil and to reduce the amount of material going to landfill. We have discussed our disposal and processing arrangements with our contractors and expect some garden waste to divert to other waste streams, which includes the plant at Rainsway, Vital Earth at Ashbourne, our contractors at Rainsway and home composting. By closely monitoring these tonnages, we will be in a position to evaluate the environmental impact later next year. Thank you. Mr. Bacon, do you have a supplementary question to Councillor Russell? I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Banwait, good evening. I emailed Councillor Banwait, i.e. yourself, on the 26th of November 2013 regarding Arboretum Recycling Bring Sites and have had no holding response or reply as of 5 p.m. today. Why is this? Good evening, Mr. Bacon. Thank you for your question. Um, in the spirit of that old adage, I am not my brother's keeper, um, unfortunately I can't respond on behalf of Councillor Bamwick, but if you want to talk to him about the email correspondence that you have shared, I'm sure he'd be prepared to do so. Okay. Ms. Skritak, do you have a supplementary question to Councillor Russell on the subject of question tampering? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Regarding the dioxin, and the Isle of Wight Derby prototype incinerator, which breached dioxin limits by 800% and is to be shut down in 2015, will the Council be setting aside compensation for the children born with birth defects because of breaches of dioxin emission from the planned Derby incinerator? Councillor Russell. Um, I personally, and I may be corrected by the monitoring officer, don't think that is a relevant supplementary question to the question that was originally asked. The question that was originally asked was relating to the tampering of uh, questions sent in to Council Cabinet members. I believe I gave a substantial response to that answer, and it was in fact human error on that occasion, and can apologise to you for that. Okay, the next question. Sorry, sorry, you've had your say. Okay, you've had your say. Mr Chadwick, you've got the, have you got a supplementary question for Councillor Baylis? Uh, good evening, uh, Councillor Bayliss. Thank you for uh, answering my question. I've got a supplementary one here. I, I, I feel that um, the, um, the trees and planters were what you might call an afterthought because if they were, had been planned in by the, uh, the, architect, the, the architect BAM, they would have designed them to go into the, the, uh, the paved area outside the council house uh, the Yorkstone paved area, um, properly planted and with um, um, a, a, a pipe down to the soil so they could be watered properly. Um, uh, but I, I've heard that this couldn't Mr. be done. Chadwick, can you just get to the question, please? Yes. I'm sorry? Yeah. Can you just ask the question? Yes, I'm just... I'm just cut out the yes, I'm just, I'm just trying to say that I think that... Uh, uh, it was an afterthought that the trees um, were not put in to the, um, the paved area, but hence Can the reason... Can you just get to the question, please? Yes, hence the reason that the, the, the planters were bought, because they couldn't be put into the, uh, the, the paved area outside the, um, the council house. I still don't understand what the question is and why I can ask poor Councillor Bailey to answer, because you've made a statement and we've heard it, but where is the question in that statement? I'm just uh, um, making a comment about... Okay, okay. We've heard your comment. Thank you very much. I'll move on to the next question then. Mr. Bacon, do you have a, any supplementary question? Do you have a supplementary question, rather? Right, I've been switched on now. Thanks very much. Um, I have, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Councillor Bamwait. <clears throat> After the Council have peddled so-called cost savings of burning our waste in Symphon to the public of Derby since 2008-9,
Are you now confirming that you have no idea what those savings are, considering the plant should now be operational? Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. I'll provide you a written answer to your supplementary as soon as possible. Yes, it will. The next question is by Ms. Skritak. Do you have a supplementary? Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. If the Isle of Wight Council was making money from renewable obligation certificates for that Derby prototype incinerator, why did the Isle of Wight Council vote to end the contract? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Skytek. Uh, I'll provide you a written answer to your supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bundy. We move on to item seven, questions about the business of Derbyshire Fire Authority and Derby Homes. Mr. Mayor, none. Mr. Mr. Mayor, with respect, you've missed the question. Mr. Chadwick is the uh, last question. Question G on uh, item six. Would you, would, you, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bayliss, um, you say that the uh, the uh, trees and um, the planters, uh, the trees cost £1,200, which to me sounds one heck of a lot of money uh, when I could go to my garden centre and they would quote me £50 per tree. Similarly, the cost of the uh, planters at £6,500 seems to be rather an extravagant amount. Councillor Bailey. They may seem quite large amounts. They, there was a robust tendering process that went, we went through to acquire this and part of the build out of this building. I assure you the, uh, the Labour group had very little to do with that. In fact, we campaigned against it. But I'm quite happy for you to see all this disclosable information that supports the procurement exercise. Thank you, Councillor Bayliss. We return to item seven. We have no items. We go on to item eight to receive questions from non-council cabinet members. We have six questions from three questionnaires, Councillor Webb, Walter, and Holmes. As I've explained before, uh, you'll only be able to ask supplementary questions, and they've got to be related to the issue that you raised in the first place. Uh, Councillor Webb, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Why is the Cabinet member proposing to put at risk the sexual health of this city uh, between the years 2014-15 and 15-16 by proposing to remove the pharmacy services for emergency oral contraception, remove sexual health student services and remove sexual health promotion including HIV education and training support all of which are covered by a public health budget which is not required to be reduced. Yes, as always I thank uh, Councillor Webb for his question even if it's inaccurate. Um, I think on the issue, let's turn of all, first of all to the issue of um, contraception. And, well, before we do that, let's kill the, uh, kill the argument about reducing the ring fence. We fully understand that the public health budget is ring fenced, and it's legally ring fenced by the Department of Health, and we observe that ring fence, and we want to on moral reasons anyway. Um, However, I will make this argument that when the public health as, a, as an entity came into this authority from the NHS, it is quite right that we should look as a local authority how that money is profiled. So the money is the same, we're reprofiling it. But the other thing that, of course, I would like to uh, bring into play here is that nobody will be looking at budgets if the government wasn't reducing, this coalition government wasn't reducing funding anywhere. Anyway, in the way they are doing the mag and in the significant levels they are doing. So that's a political issue that perhaps Councillor Webb should take up with the Right Honourable Eric Pickles MP. But in terms of the specifics, um, in terms of um, emergency contraception, that will be obtainable through pharmacies free for people under the age of 18 
and emergency contraception will be available free for those over 18 from contraception and health services, for instance, and GPs, and it can still be bought over the counter. In terms of uh, people who are living with HIV, quite simply what we're doing there is reducing, well, we are removing our support uh, for the support services, if you talk, although they provide very valuable services indeed, Derbyshire Positive Support, our proposal there is where they provide a support service, training and awareness is to remove that funding. But the key thing here is that people living with HIV will continue to have full access to the range of health treatment, interventions and support offered by the NHS. These services are predominantly not from the count, are not these, these services are predominantly the responsibility of NHS England to fund, not the Council. In these financially constrained times arising from the Coalition's government failing fiscal policies, this means making difficult decisions and reprioritising spend. Therefore, the proposal is to withdraw the funding from support services for people living with HIV in order to support the wider statutory functions that the Council must deliver in terms of public health. So in short, the National Health Service will be providing treatment for people living with HIV. It's regrettable because they do good work, but, no, uh, but organisations like DPS will see their, if these proposals go through at the next Council meeting, removed. We will be protecting the ring fence and it will be spent in a wide variety of services, um, the, end, the public health funding over a wide variety of services that we provide as a council. And I can give examples of that and I am quite happy to do so. This money will, will be used to fund existing public council services whose main or primary purpose is to improve public health of local populations, including restoring or protecting their health where appropriate and reducing health inequalities. And here's a, a, another relevant piece. The Department of Health guidance is clear that in setting their spending priorities it is important that local authorities are mindful of the overall objectives of the grant as set out in the grant conditions and I stress the next piece and the need to tackle the wider determinants of health. <coughs> These determinants are influenced by housing, by the environment, by models of social care, by transport, etc. In order to maximise the opportunities of public health move back to local government, we are creating a budget pot that can be used to fund other services that tackle the wider health determinants. Some of the programmes that we are continuing to support and their flagship programmes are, for example, like BU. And if you take BU, that offers a wide range of services for people with, for instance, obesity, smoking issues, and it can involve the family of those who, it, who it's primarily aimed at in order to ensure the health and well-being of the wider community. So we take public health service, we take public health very seriously, we're protecting that ring fence, we're redirecting some of the funding, regrettably, but we must maintain our statutory requirements. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Titley. The next supplementary question is by Councillor Poulter. Councillor Poulter. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I have to say I, I was um, disappointed with the sign-up figures for the collection service. Uh, I believe that the residents of Derby, like myself, are quite proud of the 46% recycling rate that you inherited. These figures show, in actual fact, that 97% of households in the city reject your bin tax. Only 14% of those people that you, that you projected uh, have signed up to date with only five days left. The question is how on earth are you going to make this a viable um, and a practical possibility when you've got to um, work out the number of vehicles, the number of staff, the rounds themselves. You're obviously going to have to create a final closing date for this service. What, when is that closing date, please? Councillor Bonnet. Yes, thank you, Mr. Poulter. Can I just first start by expressing my surprise at you asking this question and the next one on this same issue, given the fact that the overview scrutiny meeting just three weeks ago, you were the only opposition councillor present, and bizarrely, you didn't want me to answer any questions at all. In fact, when I insisted on asking a question, you asked the chair for me not to answer any questions on this issue. So 
If you've obviously come here to grandstand, and he has issued a statement, so let me just let members know here of that bizarre situation. And you can talk, being not at no contribution at the overview scrutiny meeting that was there to assess this, the budget. So, Councillor Poulter, so, can, so, can, so, can, so, can you let so, so, then answer the, answer so, the question? So, Councillor Poulter, let's put this into context. Because of the government and the party policy that you support, you've abandoned the Fair Deal for Derby campaign. You believe that £81 million cuts that this council, council has to make is justifiable. When all discretionary services cost £40 million. Now, clearly, you don't know your maths. Or well, you should perhaps speak to your leader. He always boasts about how intelligent he is. So £81 million savings we've got to make and all discretionary services cost £40 million. That's the gravity of the situation we're in. So we've got to make this policy work and I'm, you seem to have alluded that we've got to make it work. And actually, 70% of the city have retained their brown bins. And any modelling we've done is actually, it's actually based upon the experiences that Conservatives have provided us. Because the vast majority of councils in the East Midlands and in fact the country that have introduced the collection for garden waste, charged for the collection of garden waste, or put it another way, have withdrawn the service because it's no longer affordable, are actually of your party, Councillor Poulter. So I'm surprised you don't know that information. And all that modelling has shown us is actually comparable. You know, yes, in the early stages, it is about changing behaviours, it's about providing people information. We are encouraging people, we've made it absolutely clear, if they're not sure about uh, 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 paying for the, for, for, the, for the service for now, that to retain their brown bin, because if they hand it in, unfortunately they're going to have to pay for that brown bin again. Now, I've paid for that charge, members of my family have, because I think actually, relatively, it's £40. I mean, you could spend £700 getting your windows clean. You know, you'll have people coming around offering you two pounds to, to clean your bin out a week and people will take that up. So actually it's a relatively good value for money. So our message is not going to change and again we'll learn from the Conservative authorities out there, they have already introduced this uh, uh, charging system. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that actually this service uh, will, will, will look to pay for itself. We have to make it work and we've got to make it work together, Councillor Poulter. Because that's the gravity of this situation that this city is facing. I'm astonished that you can't see that yet. Thank you. Councillor Poulter again for your other supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just for the information of tonight's meeting, the scrutiny meeting that Councillor Banwait referred to was a budget meeting, not a, a brown bin meeting. And it wasn't on the table to be discussed, and that's why you weren't asked about it there. The fact is, you, with all your, all your protestations, Ranjit, this is a proposal, that, a choice that you've made. This is a choice that you've made to, to, to make savings on the, on the city. 97% of this city are rejecting that at this point. The residents don't want your bin tax. The question is, why don't you save yourself further embarrassment, drop this proposal now, give them their money back, and, and avoid the disaster that's going to happen in April? Because it will be. Councillor yeah. Bunbury. You need to go back to school, Councillor Poulter, and take up maths. Let me reiterate those figures again. This authority, okay, let's put it this way. You come to power in May, which is obviously, I'm, I'm, well, that's what you hopefully you seem to be campaigning towards. You come to power, you've got to find, what is it, 20 million? And then another 20 million after that? 81 million pounds. Now, let me get this, let me get, put the figures into context again, and I'm astonished you can't see it. We've got to find, stop can, can interrupting you, me, please. I did not interrupt you. Interrupting, if you can't interrupting. take the pressure, get out of the chamber. Let me answer. We've got to find 81 million pound savings. Not just we, you've got to find it if you're in control. The officers will give you the same advice, you've had the briefings, those figures aren't going to change. You can get independent auditors in and you'll come back to the same numbers. And I'm astonished you don't know that all discretionary services in this city cost £40 million. That's, paying for the, that's, paying, that's actually collecting people's garden waste, paying for children's centres, care homes, keeping our public parks, keeping our streets clean. And yes, we have made choices. You know what? I am proud to say we've made a choice to keep children's centres and care homes open ahead of having my garden rubbish collected. What is more important? You campaigned very fiercely on this, and to be honest with you, when we campaigned to keep children's centres open, we got 20,000 plus. When we handed that petition in at 10 Downing Street to your boss in 10 Downing Street, it was the biggest collection of signatures on the children's centres in the country. So when we were out collecting Talking about bin. When we were out collecting signatures on this, and compare that to your campaign, I'm talking about bins, compare that, a bunch of Tories standing next to a brown bin. Completely faceless. No human endeavour whatsoever. And that sums up, that sums you up, doesn't it? A campaign about a bin. A campaign about a bin. Can I have a bit of order, please? Can I have a bit? 
Councillor Holmes. Thank you for that, Councillor Banway. I'll give you a few moments to calm down. <laughs> Look, I've been informed that the um, I've been uh, informed that the cost may actually be as much as 40k, and actually remember that the speaker's corner was supposed to be uh, was supposed to be zero cost. So I'd ask, how can you justify this spending to the public, whilst you, whilst you? All right, let's rewind. Do you want me to carry on this question or would you like... Yeah, we'll do this. Is that okay, Mr do... Mayor? <laughs> how can you just... This is Speaker's Corner. How can you justify this spending with the public when you are cutting vulnerable people's services and funding in this city? We've got them rattled here. They can't even get the order of their questions right. OK, let's, have some, let's get some facts out there. Now, now actually, the expenditure, the 18,000... You know, well, we can get to the figures that you talk about was part of a city centre regeneration framework of regeneration, of spending money on the public realm, which actually your boss sat to your right, signed off. In fact, you were the cabinet member. And let's look at the expenditure when you were the cabinet member, how much you've signed off. You signed off, the year you were the deputy leader and the cabinet member for planning, £3,700,000. Okay. The following year, £725,000. So that's £4,425,000. Now, I'm not going to have a debate. That's a separate debate about how, you know, how that money was spent. It was value for money. I'm sure you'll have that opportunity. Now, we've inherited that, and clearly we've got to make that work. But the reality... Well, I think, Mr. Mr. Mayor, can I just have the courtesy of them stop interrupting? If they don't yeah, like yeah. the answer, don't ask the question. Simple as that. You know, if I'm not giving you the answers you want, don't ask the questions. If you can't take the answers, which you clearly can't, just please be quiet, let Can me answer it. So £4,425,000. So I'd like an opportunity for you to tell me how you've justified spending £4,425,000. And interestingly, we've actually spent far less than that. And I'm pretty proud that is value for money. So I, on the one hand, we have, a, yes, we have adopted the city regeneration framework, which Councillor Hickson signed off, and Councillor Hickson led a consultation, and that consultation feedback was, especially in the city centre perspective, and he used to love saying, what was it, suits on the street? Is that right, was it saying? Suits on the street. What was that about? Attract attracting footfall into the city centre. Why? So that the city centre is an attractive, vibrant place for people to come, work, spend their money to shop and to regenerate the city centre. So I'd be very interested to sit down with you and for you to justify how you can sign off. You've got the audacity to come here and talk about £18,000. And yes, every penny for taxpayers is very, very important. But that scheme did involve consultation. The Speaker's Corner itself was a cross-party initiative, which Councillor Wood, sat to your left, actually supported. Well, here we go again. Interruptions again. You know, if you've lost the argument, don't, if you can't take the answers, don't ask the questions, Councillor Wood. So we've got nothing to be ashamed of, and we will make every penny count. Chair, Chair thank you. Ms. Thank you, Councillor Bombay. Councillor Holmes, do you have a supplementary question to Councillor Rawson on the subject of children and young people's budget proposal? I do, uh, so Mr Mayor. Sorry the for order. the order. I am. I am. I'm sorted. I'm sorted. I'm ready. Councillor Rawson, I'm sure you'd like to, um, to actually justify here tonight how you're cutting um, funding from the Leopold uh, Street unit, some of which the team are here tonight. Um, in the public gallery, how can you justify to them, actually, not to me, how can you justify to them cutting their funding and other um, uh, facilities and services which are supposed to protect and do very well protect Derby children from sexual exploitation? How can you justify putting that when you're allocating 150,000 for people who have, in most cases, no legal right to remain in the UK? Yeah. Councillor Rawson. Yes, uh, uh, Thank you, uh, Councillor Holmes, uh, for, your, for your question. Um, the issue around um, people with uh, uh, no recourse to public funds um, isn't particularly an issue for me or this authority to answer because, as you well know, um, expenditure in 
uh, that uh, domain is governed by national legislation and in fact by uh, the Children Act um, which uh, your own Conservative government passed in, in 1989. So maybe your question would be better directed uh, to uh, Conservative government ministers uh, in, in regard to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the, the cheap point that I think you're trying to make about immigrants in this country. And I hope you're not saying actually that um, a child who's in need in this country, whatever their background, uh, doesn't deserve any help or support. Um, because I know the Conservatives are the nasty party, uh, but I'm sure that even the nasty party wouldn't uh, stoop to those depths. Councillor Holmes, do you have a supplementary question to Councillor Barnwith on the subject of adverse winter weather preparations? I do, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the information. That's very welcome news. Um, and I'm sure you'd uh, like to acknowledge the work that the former Conservative Council did to ensure a salt barn was built and adequate stocks uh, were put into that barn and ordered well in advance in a programme uh, with officers put into place to make sure that happened well in advance of the winter months. Um, the benefits of which um, we're seeing now. Thank you. Okay, now we move on to item nine, to consider minutes and recommendations of the council cabinet requiring approval of the council. There have been three cabinet meetings since we last met, being on 16th of October, 6th November, and 11th of December. There are no minutes from any of those three meetings requiring approval. As I said at the beginning of the meeting, I propose that we now consider the minutes of the accounts committee uh, which was held on Wednesday 11th of December. They relate to the support on protecting the public purse and recommended the appointment of an anti-fraud champion. And in turn, that we should appoint the chair of the Audit and Accounts Committee. Do I have a proposal for the approval of Audit and Accounts Minutes 45 stroke 13? Do we? Thank you, Chair. Um, can I formally move the minutes of the Audit and Accounts Committee? And modesty prevents me from recommending myself in, in the um, motion that's proposed, and therefore I've asked the leader to do it because he doesn't <laughs> mind a bit of immodesty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could I formally move the motion? <coughs> pertains to the Council Cabinet meeting that we need to move and formally move that the Chair of Audit Accounts is the mm -hmm. anti-fraud champion and that will be Councillor Roberts. Could I move that, Mr. Is that seconded? Yeah. Those in favour? Any against? That's carried. Item 10, appointment to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Does anyone wish to speak? Can I formally move as printed, Mr. Mayor? Sorry, Councillor Skelton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I seem to remember, I don't know whether the monitor officer can be helpful in this matter, that um, a few uh, council meetings ago, we actually um, approved that the deputy PCC, Councillor Dinser, was going to go on to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, is this in addition to Councillor Williams, uh, Councillor Dinser, or instead of? I can only say in the answer to that question, we, we offered a place to the police. There was a discussion with the police and Crown Commissioner and the Deputy and the Crown Commissioner himself decided he would like to take the place and therefore that's the basis of the recommendation tonight. Do we have a seconder? Is that agreed? Those in favour? Any against? That's carried. Item 11 co-option of members to the Children and Young People's Overview and Scrutiny Board. Does anyone wish to speak? Could I formally have move the motion is printed then, Mr. Mayor? Do we have a seconder? Those in favour? Anyone against? Item 12. Appointment to Osmaston Regeneration Partnership Joint Venture Vehicle. This is a two-part motion 
for part one, do I have a nomination for an elected member? I'm going to be in modest, Mr. Mayor, and recommend myself. <laughs> for part two, can I have a proposal, please? Is that seconded? Formally moved, Mr. Mayor. Those in favour? Any against? It's carried. Now we get to item 13, notices of motion. We have four. The first is proposed by Councillor Bayless and seconded by Councillor Banvitt. Councillor Bayless. So, Banvitt, sorry. Can I speak, Mr. Mayor? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, and a Merry Christmas to everybody here and everybody who's watching on the webcam. Um, I put before Council this evening a motion to support the Local Government Association, our trade body that operates on a cross-party basis so we can support the rewiring public services debate. What I'm seeking here, Mr Mayor, is a cross-party support for this and the LGA. We want to campaign for the vision of the funding formula, and I say the complete reform of the Barnet formula, that does nothing to help this council and councils up and down the country uh, in terms of the current budget settlement. The ten principles of the LGA call for action are one, a local treasurer in every place. Two, the local service and decisions being made in one place. Three, cut the Whitehall silos and have an England office. Uh, four, share money fairly across the UK, replace the Barnet formula with a needs-based funding regime. Five, take financial distribution out of ministers' hands and have an agreement across England. Uh, six, keep local decisions local, not in Whitehall. I'm sure we'll all agree with this one. End the pointless inspections we get. Eight, allow local investment and allow the use of municipal bonds and a market for them. Nine, a multi-year funding form retired to the life of a parliament. And ten, protect local government settlement by legal constitutional protection. It's also interesting, Mr Mayor, that in this vein, the Political and Constitutional Reform Select Committee, led by Graham Allen MP, has published a report on the democratic and practical issues around codifying in statute the principles and mechanics of the relationship between central and local government. I think that will be a good thing. With our trade body agreeing that the current funding formula is not working and is all but broken, it's time to reflect the points that this council makes as <coughs> part of its fair deal for Derby campaign. And in fact, we were well in advance of the body politic of local government association. It is clear where this administration leads, others now follow. This is a clear vindication of the points we made in the media, both nationally and locally, and to the Minister himself. To remind councillors, I will give a couple of examples. The basis for calculating concessionary travel funding for, from actual boardings, the facts, which we pay on, is modelled on a fiction in terms of a formula assessment. The difference in the fact and the fiction, as I've said here before, is £2.6 million. The Council has had significant concerns over this methodology, uh, but the EFT consistently underestimates the number of people who use the bus station in the city and who prefers paying us on, a, on fiction rather than facts. Uh, I asked the Minister, Brandon Lewis, who was in the House today, uh, answering questions at local government question time, to simply pay us for the bus tickets we actually issue. Um, a positive answer from the Ministry is still awaited, Mr Mayor. I would also like to see this Council being recognised that it's a low Council tax authority and that cross-party prudence should be recognised. The point, surprisingly, so far has been ignored. Even today, Mr Mayor, uh, the MP for Derby North as asked in the House of Commons what choices the Minister would make in the light of our future budget position. Again, Mr Mayor, no useful answer was delivered by the Minister at that time. We also asked some time ago to be allowed to spend the housing PFI money that Roger Kershaw and his team had calculated and negotiated so that we actually build more houses within the <coughs> funding agreement given to us, allocated by some time ago so we could build more homes in the city, more homes that the government thought we could build because of our prudent and successful negotiation. Again on this, they asked us for the money back, only to then top slice new owners bonus, 
which went to the left, and now the view turned and given it us back. If they'd have stopped faffing about, we could have built many more houses in this city. We'd like to have the freedom to shape and set revenue locally, with local councils being the local democratic mandate to meet the challenges we face in the city. We also have to get the electorate in at a place that they understand how council informally works and the, issues, the real issues that council is facing. By 1617, it's calculated in the projections I've seen that there's up to a £55 million hole in accounts out of a £200 million revenue account. Into the figures that I've calculated, that means we've got more money to cut than we have when you combine all the statutory services together. So the question is, where do you go from then? Which of the legal services do we actually cut? Not a position that's going to be easy for any administration to answer. So we have a massive challenge, Mr Mayor. The stark fact that this will be a central plank of the further big conversation we have of both the current budget consultation round and in the future. <coughs> in the LGA initiative, this is the first joined up cross-party consensus agreed to enable us to speak as one voice to government. It's important, Mr Mayor, that this council supports the LGA and the local government community in taking these messages to government, and therefore I move the motion, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bayliss. Councillor Barnabet, do you wish to speak as a seconder? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I second this motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Councillor Carr. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I have an amendment which I've signed. However, there's no need to circulate it. It simply says, delete all of paragraph 3. Do we... That's okay. And the motion will read. Can you, can you read it out? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just to clarify, um, the motion would then read, um, Derby City Council welcomes the LGA initiative rewiring public services and resolves to support the general thrust of the proposal set out in the, pro in the programme of ten big ideas. We believe the re-energising of local authorities is long overdue following the centralisation of services by successive governments, resulting in councils being unable to adequately provide local services, particularly in the current climate of austerity. If it helps, Mr Mayor, I've already had a conversation with Councillor Hickson, and his group, I think, wanted to do exactly the same thing. And on that basis, I will accept the deletion of that paragraph. In that case, uh, my group will be supporting this motion, Chair. Sorry, what is the status of the amendment now then? Is that, are we going back to the... It's accepted. Yeah, yes. Do we need to take a vote on it then, don't we? Yeah, sorry, that's fine. You want to speak on the amendment? Yeah, okay, Councillor Banwit. Yes, Mr Mayor, as the leader said, and I agree with the leader, we're happy to, you know, the first priority is getting cross-party motion. But, again, we've got the condemns... The Liberal Democrat Tories running scared on Fair Deal for Derby. I mean, Fair Deal for Derby itself started off as a cross-party cross campaign. Well, yes, it is necessary because it's my right to be able to speak on this amendment. That's the Constitution. So, you know, let's, again, let, let's look at this bizarre situation that we, we're accepting that actually Derby's not getting a fair deal, for, but we don't want to say it. We, we, we can't be saying it's a fair deal for Derby, but we're not getting a fair deal for Derby. And so let's look at these figures of how unfair this situation is, is. Funding per person, and we've demonstrated that, the cuts per person, and I've got some figures here. One, firstly, we've got a clear north-south divide, which hopefully the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats are saying they want to campaign on. Funding per person between 2010 and 2012 in the East Midlands is, le is, is a cut of £160. In London, it's a gain. It's actually gone up per person of £45. And another interesting stats, projections per person in the year 2017 and 18, in Derby, the cut per person is going to be projected to be £354. But I have an interesting uh, figure for comparison. Guess where in the, city, in the country it's actually a gain of £57? Can anybody guess? Well, it's a place called West Oxfordshire. And guess who happens to be an MP there? Well, it's our own Prime Minister, David Cameron. That's how unfair this situation is. That's why we've launched a campaign 
fair deal for Derby. So it's absolutely bizarre. They make your mind up. Are you therefore saying, yes, the situation, the cuts being imposed by parties you're members of from a government that you back is unfair? If you agree this motion, clearly you're saying that. So we will in I will certainly interpret that, that you agree that Derby is being treated unfairly and that the fair deal for Derby is, 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 is absolutely right, that right campaign. And can I just say this? I like to think that, you know, the, the residents of West Oxfordshire would actually be delighted to know that they've got Conservative and Liberal Democrat councillors in Derby that historically up to date have abandoned the fair deal for Derby campaign just to make sure that they get a great deal in West Oxf Oxfordshire. But I get to see now that clearly we're saying that Derby is being unfairly treated. So it looks like the fair deal for Derby is back on. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Higginbottom. Councillor, I'll bring you in because it's your amendment. I'll get you to round it up. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm just checking that I understood what Councillor Bailey said. He was happy to accept the amendment from, Council, um, from the Liberal Democrats. And he'd already had the conversation with Councillor Hickson about the same. So I just wonder what that contribution was about. The, the, they've accepted the amendment. I think that's the gist of it. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't going to speak until Councillor Benway just spoke. He mentioned fair being fair. Let's, let's just think about the fairness of our neighbourhood budgets. That's fair, isn't it? If you're using parliamentary constituencies, you can use the same argument on city wards. Now, let's have a look at cross-party agreement. Councillor Bailey said he wanted cross-party agreement on this. Why the heck didn't you ask us before the meeting, before we saw it in print? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, could I do a personal Sorry. explanation to CP64? I emailed it your leader at the same time I emailed it Councillor Hickson. Can I, can I point out that Councillor Jones is very ill? Okay. Councillor Hickson. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in terms of the motion, the removal of the third paragraph, actually, wasn't meant to damage the motion. Rather, it was meant to strengthen it. And um, Councillor Bayliss and I were at the Local Government Association Conference in Manchester last June when the uh, report, uh, Rewiring Public Services, was discussed in quite a bit of detail. And I think most of the large authorities certainly were signed up to that. I think it's unfortunate that Councillor uh, Banwait has decided to, for whatever reason, try to derail what needs to be a cross-party consensus. And I'm always pleased to hear from Councillor Banwait uh, in these debates. He reminds me of when I was young and stupid, but it doesn't necessarily, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily add anything to the, uh, to the particular debate. Now, now in, terms of the, in terms of the debate about rewiring uh, public services, uh, Sir Merrick Cockrell, I think, who, uh, who led on this for the LGA, put forward a range of very important points about re-energising local authorities. And I think it's fair to say, and I accept the point that Councillor Bayliss has made, uh, that successive governments, whatever colour they've been, have promised in opposition to return powers to local government, and then when they've got in power have been very reluctant to do so. And that's happened across uh, both parties, um, and much to our dismay, because we, as local politicians, want to be able to do as much as possible in the city. So we do support the motion without paragraph three. We think that the re-energising of local authorities is long overdue. That re-energising, of course, might be to the detriment of smaller authorities like South Derbyshire uh, and uh, Erewash, for example, who might find uh, that they are uh, overtaken in this debate and, and might be absorbed in due course by uh, premier authorities like Derby City. And we'll have to have that debate uh, in due course as, uh, as we move forward. But in terms of returning services, we're absolutely on the same page with you on that. We do want to make sure that we can do as much as possible locally. We do support the general thrust of the proposals that were set out by Merrick Cockle, and we're happy to support the motion as amended. Thank you, Councillor Hickson. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, uh, the intervention by uh, Councillor Bowenwake kind of threw me off my stride. I was going to make a lot of points. Uh, mostly on the lines of uh, Councillor Bailey's. I agree with almost everything Councillor Bailey's said. The point is that the political element is about Derby. Now, we on this side of the chamber 
believe that all local authorities matter and there are lots of other northern local authorities who are disadvantaged by the Barnet formula and if when you proposed fair deal for Derby you'd proposed a national campaign against the Barnet for formula we would have supported it wholeheartedly instead of a naked political attempt just to blame this excellent coalition government which is restoring <laughs> which, which, which in view of the figures we've seen today on, on, on unemployment and economics is doing a good job we, we would have supported that campaign and it would have been much better if the local LGA resolution as printed, which I would support every line in there, had been the resolution that was proposed by this council. But I'm happy that we've got cross-party support and I agree with Councillor Hicks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Holmes. Just a quick point. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. Um, look, let's be clear here. A fair deal for Derby, the Labour propaganda machine, is very different to wanting a fair deal for Derby, which we all do in this chamber. You know, we, we are councillors, whether we're in administration or opposition, of course we want a fair deal for Derby. What, what we originally signed up for turned into a propaganda campaign machine and continues to be for Labour. Of course we don't support that, but of course we support a fair deal for Derby. There's a very, very big difference. Thank you. I am now going to put the amendment to the vote. Those for the motion as amended, please show you. Any against? The amendment has carried. Now we go back to the substantive motion. Well, let's uh, move to the vote, Mr. Mayor. Let's uh, get on with the next piece of business. Move to the vote. Those for the motion? Any against? It's carried. Our second motion is proposed by Councillor Rawson and seconded by Councillor Whitby. Councillor Rawson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the purpose of this motion is twofold. Um, firstly, to recognise the enormous achievement of schools in Derby over the past 18 months and put on record our thanks to everyone involved in driving these improvements. Head teachers, governors, teachers, support staff, local authority improvement partners and the children and students themselves. And secondly, given our strong track record in school improvement in Derby in the recent past, to call upon the Secretary of State to give us and other local authorities the powers and resources we need to ensure high standards at all schools in the city, including free schools. The motion references an article in the Derby Telegraph um, which highlights the improvements made from 43% of pupils attending a good or outstanding school on the 31st of August 2012 to 71% at the end of August 2013. And this figure has increased slightly again to stand at 72% as of this week. When this Labour administration came into office in May 2012, Mr Mayor, we recognised that some schools were underperforming and we made school improvement our priority. This Labour administration gave officers a clear focus to drive up standards. We introduced the Education Development Board uh, to bring together best practice and to challenge our approach to school improvement. We introduced regular updates on school performance to the Cabinet agenda so Cabinet members and the public can monitor and hold to account more easily myself and officers. And we introduced additional resources to the School Improvement Service so that we can do more work with even more schools. So Mr Mayor, we're making good progress. We're not complacent, but we do need to recognise the progress that has been made and where schools are doing well, they need to be praised and encouraged. I have to say, though, that some comments made by national politicians are extremely unhelpful. Michael Gove, in particular, continues to insist on using out-of-date information when referring to Derby. His response to a question from Derby North MP Chris Williamson recently in the House of Commons is a case in point. He persists in using data from 2012 when he knows full well that the latest results in Derby 
show us to be one of the most improved authorities in the country. I don't know if Mr Gove realises that when he uses this rather poor data and he is actually referring to a period when his own Conservative Party and their coalition partners, the Liberal Democrats, were running Derby City Council. But perhaps he has as much disdain for members of his own party as he obviously does for the current administration. But, Mr Mayor, the spreading of this misinformation continues. Indeed, only today in the Derby Telegraph, a DfE spokesperson is quoted as saying, too many schools in Derby are underperforming and failing their pupils, particularly in primary schools. I'm not complacent, Mr Mayor, <clears throat> and I don't mind receiving criticism when it's justified, but the comments of Gove and others are completely at odds with the data and cause tremendous offence and discouragement to schools who are proving that they are providing a really good high-quality education. <clears throat> These throwaway remarks by people like Gove, who really should know better, do have real consequences. In the Derby Telegraph today, we see the story of a head who is advertising for teachers on a banner outside his school because he is struggling to recruit. He is convinced that the ill-founded comments of Gove are having an impact on attracting the best people to teach in Derby. That can't be right. How is that helping to improve and drive up standards? These comments, which are being made for purely political reasons, need to be challenged, and we need to set the record straight. 72% of children in Derby go to a good or outstanding local school. Indeed, Ofsted, in their recent report, uh, their recent annual report, um, specifically mentioned um, the progress which Derby has made. So just for once, let's have the government recognising the excellent work which is going on in schools all over our city. As I said, Mr Mayor, I'm not complacent, <coughs> and moving forward, I want every school to be good or better, and indeed, we'll be giving a lead on supporting more schools to move to outstanding. This Labour administration has asp aspirations of high-quality education for all schools in the city, including free schools. The findings of Ofsted when they inspected the Al Medina Free School are extremely concerning. Indeed, the most recent monitoring visit found things had actually got worse, which is even more alarming. Anyone connected with education in this city will struggle to recall a worse Ofsted report of any school anywhere in the country. And I don't think it's right that just because free schools are the pet project of the Education Secretary, his ideological experiment with the education of our children, that they, they should escape proper scrutiny. I don't think it's right that children attending that school should be subjected to a poor standard of education just because it's a free school. And I don't think it's right that free schools should be in any way politically protected. Had Derby City Council had the legal duty to oversee at Al Medina, I'm sure the issues connected with this school would have not arisen or would have been dealt with at a very much earlier stage. The local authority could have taken direct intervention powers and quickly put the school back on track. The record of our school improvement service would certainly suggest that this is the case. But instead, children at the school have suffered an extremely poor education over the course of the year, with very questionable prospects for improvement any time soon. This motion, Mr Mayor, is less about the rights and wrongs of free schools, although this Labour group believes that the dangers of free schools have unfortunately been fully exposed by recent events at Al Medina. The motion is about recognising the significant improvement in educational attainment in schools in the city and thanking all of those who have brought this about. And it is also about seeking for the local authority the legal powers and resources which are needed to ensure that all our children receive the education which they deserve. Councillor yeah. Whitby. I'll second, my, uh, I'll second my, the motion and reserve my right, Mr Mayor. Do we have any other speakers? Councillor Bailey. Bailey. Good evening, Mr Mayor. Uh, this motion and the political diatribe I've heard tonight saddens me. Yeah. 
Yeah. The Conservative group on the Derby City Council have pledged never to play party politics with children's services, despite the attempts, attempted jibes and cheap political point scoring by the Labour group tonight. We will keep to that pledge. We will continue to work in partnership with our school improvement teams, head teachers, staff, governors, parents and pupils in the school improvement journey, but refuse to lower our standards to those shown by this administration. There is still more improvements to be made, and in partnership we were positive that the city schools will rise to this challenge and ensure that all our children get the best education possible. Thank you. I think uh, Councillor Bailey ought to reflect on the words that he had pre-prepared before here in the speech, well that's how it appears to me anyway. On the basis that Almadina School has been a, a sunken battleship for Mr Gove, that was his political goal, free schools, free schools will be the way forward, political doctrine madness. And what do we, what do we get? We get him then undermining the actual achievement that this authority has had in improving educational standards during the period of this administration. I think across the board, within the education sector of this council, led politically here by my good friend and colleague, Councillor Rawson, has uh, really achieved some uh, major, it's reached some high peaks. I might make the odd uh, word slip here, Councillor, but I don't always prepare my speeches beforehand. So um, I think the thing here is quite clear. We've got a sense of high achievement. What is Gove doing? He's undermining the position, not just of the existing cohort of children, in terms of what people think about their education. He's also undermining this is a city where people want to come and move and work, because the message he's getting out there nationally is the schools are not good. And he's doing it just to further his own ideological beliefs. As a journalist, well, that's what he might believe. But as somebody who's worked in business, in a small way, in a large business, I can tell you that one of the factors, and there's plenty of people on the Conservative bench who know this as well as on these benches, is that when large companies are choosing to relocate or attract good people or people to their company, one of the things those people will look at is the quality of education. And Gove is consistently underselling that to push a doctrine. And I think that's very false and I think it's very dangerous for this city. And I think rather than Councillor Bailey re reading a pre-prepared speech, he ought to write to Gove, even if he does it very quietly and very discreetly and say, you're damaging this city and you're not doing the Conservative Party any good within it because you're misrepresenting the real value of education in this city and do something more sensible with Al Medina. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I haven't prepared this speech either, so I might make a slip or two. Uh, I am not here to protect Mr Gove. I don't think anybody in their right mind can protect Mr Gove. He's the wrong person in the wrong job. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, I've had similar conversations with, uh, as uh, Councillor Rawson uh, has described, uh, with Mr Gove. I've had similar conversations with Jim Knight and Ed Balls when they were education ministers. They were just as intransigent. It's not just one particular person. I think the root cause is somewhere in that civil service down at uh, uh, the DES and that's where we need to be applying the pressure. Uh, the ministers are front guys, they've got ideology, but I remember asking for local governance in the academies. They didn't want any local representation. Uh, I remember discussing uh, some sort of financial control. They're totally independent, they do what they like with the money. It's the money that belongs to the rest of our schools, but they've taken it away. Um, and now we've got free schools who are taking that particular um, line to its extreme. And uh, if Martin can get somewhere with, with this and bring the free schools and the academies back under local influence and local control, it will be a job well done. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I mean, in, Councillor Rawson is to be highly commended in the results that this city's education and this, under this council's watch has now, has now experienced. But let's talk about the ship and how difficult a job that was and where we've come from, what a low mark we've come from. It's not just the position we inherited from the coalition, but going back further, when Les Allen was the cabinet member for CYP, 
That's when the decline first started, Councillor Allen. So it's pretty rich of you to sit there, criticise a government that you're part of and support, and yet uh, you know, try to ride on the back of the coattails of the success Cannot of get Councillor, away with this. He, of he's he's criticising things without any justification whatsoever. I need you to ask him to prove what he's just said. Thank you. Riding on the back of the coattails of Councillor Rawson. So an absolute disgrace, sir. And the question begs in, I ask you to demonstrate. The reality is, look at the position that the Conservatives inherited was pretty bad. It was even worse when we took power. And look at the success we've achieved in such a short space of time. And that is down to the vision that this administration has shown, Mr Mayor. But also, Mr Mayor, let's just... I mean, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to fall into this trap and we've got a motion, actually, where it's talking about let's not get personal. So I'm not going to get personal with Councillor Hickson. I'm not going to call him old and stupid, because I was, I was brought up to respect my elders. It's a very traditional Sikh. It's a very traditional Sikh and Asian thing, so I'll, I'll stick to that. But what I will ask for is a resignation. This council deserves a resignation, because wasn't it a Conservative councillor? And she's not, uh, she's not here, Councillor Williams. It's unfortunate. Didn't she say, and I'm glad the Derby Telegraph are here, so they can vouch for this. Um, we, a Telegraph article appeared titled Resignation Pledge from City Councillor, 15th of December 2010. I wonder who that was from? That was from the Cabinet Member for CYP. And Councillor Hickson, I think you were the leader, Councillor Hickson. Now, 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 the reality is, Councillor Yvonne Williams was recognising that performances were pretty bad under her watch, part of the coalition she was part of, and if they didn't get better, like she couldn't live with her conscience that she would do the honourable thing and fall on, her, fall on her sword. The fact is, she still hasn't done that. So the question now falls on, Councillor Hickson, the obligation now falls on you. What is the accountability of that administration to the failures? Because you've got to bear in mind, the performances are improving now, but the kids that lost out then, under your administration, under Councillor Les Allen's watch, those kids have been damaged, potentially, permanently. That's the reality. You only get one chance of an education. You only get one chance. And when you lose it, it can, it can scar you for life, uh, Mr Mayor. So the reality is, this administration has delivered on its commitment, has shown real passion and commitment, not just words. Anybody can do that, Councillor Allen, and you did a lot in your time as a Cabinet member. So, Mr Mayor, I'm pretty proud of this administration's record. We have delivered on our commitment, and I commend <coughs> Councillor Rawson in the decisions that he's taken and the recommendations that he's made to this administration that have delivered these improvements. Thank you. Councillor Whitby, do you, do you wish yeah, to speak? Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the rise, and rise of Derby School's Ofsted gradings is something to be very, very pleased about, Mr Mayor. Of course, we still expect further improvement. We want the best for every child in Derby. But what, for what has been achieved thus far, enormous thanks should be given to our fabulous school improvement team at Derby City Council. Mr Mayor, I've got to say that the recent run of success uh, has restored my faith in Ofsted. I have to admit that I used to think that in some sort of way they, they seemed as though they were out to get us. But uh, now it seems that there's only one man that seems to be out to get us, and that's the Secretary of State for Education. He takes every opportunity to bring us down, to bring this city down, to bring its teachers and its children down. And it's all based on old data. Mr Mayor, it doesn't matter who you are, from what walk of life, or how high or lowly your position is. If you're going to publicly criticise a body, organisation or person, you get your facts straight first. It's an absolute basic. I think the Secretary of State for Education could learn a few lessons himself. Of course, there's one notable school amongst the 28% of Derby schools that aren't good or outstanding, um, that we as a council have absolutely no control or influence over. And I'm not necessarily criticising Al Medina here for the state they're in, uh, because they didn't make the rules. Who was it that allowed just anybody to set up a school using taxpayers' money? Who allowed these schools to be located anywhere? Who allowed them to use unqualified teachers? Who designed a system with no scrutiny? Who allowed them to teach more or less anything? It's, it's Michael Gove. Uh, so when Ofsted slate Al Medina for not having qualified teachers, they're slating Michael Gove and his policies. It's as ridiculous to have a school without qualified teachers as it is to set up a medical centre without qualified doctors or nurses. Our children deserve better, Mr Mayor. And the very best thing Gove could do now is return these schools to local education authority so they can be accountable and they can be scrutinised. 
And the very least that it can do is apologise to the head teachers, the teachers and the children of Derby for getting it wrong again. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to put the motion to vote. Those for the motion? Those against? It's carried. Our third motion is proposed by Councillor Russell and seconded by Councillor Banwait. Councillor Russell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, in the run-up to Christmas time, I don't think there's been ever a more pertinent time to discuss the cost of living crisis. It's an epidemic that is sweeping the nation and impacting on Derby's most poor and vulnerable residents. It's a blight on communities and a shameful indictment of this coalition's record in government. Christmas should be a time for celebration. For some Derby families, this will not be their reality this year. More so like a scene from A Christmas Carol, with the role of the miser Ebenezer Scrooge being played so viciously by David Cameron and George Osborne. Times are harder than ever. With prices rising faster than wages, the average family is £1,600 worse off now than they were in 2010. Latest research from the Trussell Trust suggests that there are a staggering 13 million people living below the poverty line in the UK. A shocking statistic considering that we are one of the most economically developed countries in the world. In 2010, food banks fed 61,000 people. In 2012, that figure has risen to 347,000, an increase of over 500% since the coalition came to office. Here in Derby, there are 17 food banks in operation and take-up of their services has exploded since the welfare reforms hit. Despite the intransigence of central government here in Derby, we are easing the burden on residents across the city. We provide families food vouchers through our local assistance scheme, which is already proven to be innovative and UK leading in its delivery and sustainability. We support the third sector through this scheme, as well as providing food, furniture and utilities top-ups for those that are most in need. We have seen a sharp rise in people approaching us to help keep their houses warm, particularly in the last few weeks, with utility prices shooting up and the temperature plummeting. And it's no wonder this help is needed with an estimated 3.2 million people living in fuel poverty in this country. Research completed by Citizens Advice suggests that the big six energy companies will have increased their prices by 37% between October 2010 and January next year. That's why here in Derby we have taken part in an energy switching scheme which has allowed our residents to save up to £412 per year on their energy bills. But let's not pretend that that's enough. There's been an excellent suggestion from Ed Miliband that we freeze energy prices for 18 months and reform the market to ensure it's fair for consumers. While David Cameron was panicking after this announcement, he ended up making policy on the hoof. True to form, the Prime Minister has bowed to the will of his corporate paymasters and scrapped the green levies on energy bills. An interesting piece of policy for a man who promised to lead the greenest government ever. And what will this achieve for consumers? It will mean that the shareholders of the big six will be able to cream off even bigger dividends. And it certainly won't translate to savings in the bills that land on our doormats. Energy Secretary Ed Davey wants to ditch a long-standing pledge to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016. He wants to amend the Energy Bill to say that fuel poverty will be addressed. I find this typical of the Liberal Demo Democrat Party nationally, Mr Mayor, which has said one thing and always voted for another. When we need real action to help people with the cost of living, all we get is diluted policy and broken promises. After Labour's Stella Creasy initiated a campaign against payday lenders, I welcome the Chancellor's pledge to limit interest rates on payday loans. But we must do more to ensure that unsustainable consumer borrowing is not the future for everyone. Action must be taken to limit the unscrupulous profiteering of payday lenders and provide alternative forms of short-term finance. All these issues, including the abhorrent bedroom tax, are pushing people in our city further into poverty. We are playing our part here in Derby, and I'm particularly proud of the fact that we have increased the pay of our lowest paid staff to that of the living wage.
but nationally we must do more. That is why I am asking the Council as a whole to call on the Government to ease the burden on working people. A coalition government determined to impose an ideological experiment in Britain has shown it has no concern for the people of Derby, leaving many cold, hungry and debt-ridden this Christmas. But I believe their party colleagues locally are capable of standing alongside us and putting Derby residents first. We can stand as one in support of our city's poorest and most vulnerable people and families who will struggle to heat their homes this Christmas let alone buy presents and a Christmas dinner. That's why I call on all members in this chamber to please support this motion. Yes, Chair, um, I second this motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on this motion? Councillor Repton, and then... Councillor Repton. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll be quite brief, uh, because I think Councillor Russell has covered quite adequately the feelings of this Labour group. I think the majority of people in this city and, and the majority in this country. I think it's very apt and sad at this time of year. It is a bit like Dickens' Christmas Carol. And here we have the ghost of Christmas present. With the, the, uh, with the Prime Minister giving tax cuts for his millionaire chums in Oxfordshire, fat, uh, fat profits for his fat caps of the big six energy companies, and yet for the majority of people in this country, we're facing financial misery at this winter of uh, 2013. £1,600 worst off a year since they came to power in 2010. We have fuel prices rocketing, a cost of living crisis, we have hundreds of thousands of people relying on food banks just to survive these winter months. And if we look forward, what will Christmas future be like? Certainly under this government, it will be future misery. It will be fine for those at the top, but struggling for those hard-working families and those struggling at the bottom. And those at the very bottom have had the biggest hit of everybody in this country. And it is a lie when they say we're all in it together. We've had the bedroom tax. We've had all the benefits chopped from people who need them to, for them and their families to survive. So as we look at Christmas present, let us think about Christmas future. We can make a change. Labour will make a change when we get a Labour government. And I think the, the people of this country are fast coming to that conclusion as well. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Working through the uh, motion in sequence... We appreciate that this motion was created before the latest drop in unemployment was published. Otherwise, councillors Russell and Banwet would no doubt have congratulated the coalition government for the ongoing reductions in unemployment. The current low employment, unemployment levels make the third paragraph's call for a national living wage more achievable. Otherwise, an increase in wages could increase unemployment to the levels we inherited from Labour. The next paragraph states that this administration is tackling the cost of living, presumably implying a reduction. This rather conflicts with the proposal in the 11th of December Cabinet meeting to tax large retail outlets in Derby, which will uh, either increase prices in Derby or re result in these large retail outlets making their workers redundant or some of their redun workers redundant. Finally, the Lib Dems in government will be moderately pleased to receive the support of this council in the, further, the Lib Dems' proposal to continue to reduce workers' taxation levels by further raising the tax threshold. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, talk about using out-of-date data. As we know, the, the measure that uh, Councillor Russell has used to derive the 1,600 pound figure is RPI, which has now been totally discredited both in this country and internationally, is, is soon to be dropped. Uh, it, 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 we are in a difficult situation. Oh, she mentioned unsustainable borrowing. Well, how did we get in this mess? I seem to think it was unsustainable borrowing by Messrs Brown and Balls when they were in government. Uh, and finally, yes, just to mention, if you, if you take off the, the next rise in the... Um, 
tax threshold already mentioned by Councillor Ashburn and use a proper measure of inflation, the figure is nothing like the £1,600 quoted by Councillor Russell. Thank you. Councillor Titley. Thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. I think if you were to go out um, to the man and woman in the street in Derby or anywhere probably north of Watford and ask them whether they felt the economy was in a state of real improvement from their point of view, I think they'd probably say not. The salaries have been more or less static. If you work in the public sector, they've been static until very recently. Um, house prices, yes, have fallen, but the cost of living has gone through the roof. Um, the only reason the economy has gone anywhere anyway is because it has been stimulated and actually RPI and Councillor Carr might have a passing interest in this because they assume like me he is a Rolls Royce pensioner but like a lot of pension schemes that used to be increased with, by RPI not CPI. Now at one point there were coincident that actually usually R RPI gives you a larger sum of money so I am still quite interested in RPI but I think the fundamental point here is this that nobody who, li who lives in a city like Derby feels better off. I feel worse off, and I'm probably more affluent than a lot of people. Everybody feels off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except, Brother Rob <laughs> except Councillor Roberts, of course. <laughs> except Councillor Roberts, who's on a railway pension. Anyway, th there you go. But um, the underlying fact is this, that we have high levels of poverty in this country, and that's continuing to be the case, and it will grow. Does youth unemployment diminish? Well, I feel as though it doesn't, and it reminds me of when I was a young person in the 1980s, which I can't believe was 30 years ago now. And I was very, very lucky. I felt as very, very lucky to have a job at Rolls-Royce, because if I lost it, and people were worried about losing jobs even from there then, would you get another job? And some of these people who have qualified with degrees, they are getting the sort of jobs where you used to get a job for o, uh, at an O-level standard. So well, my son's got a job, very proud of him doing that, and I think that's excellent. But in the, re in the reality of it is, people are struggling, young people are struggling, elderly people are struggling. So I don't care in this sense what the economists tell us. The reality of it is that unless you live around the home counties, the economy is not booming. And we actually live in what's so-called an economic bubble because we've got high technology companies here. But if you go out into Derbyshire and in certain quarters of this city, which we represent, you will not feel good economically or socially. So let's put that one to bed. And don't forget RPI Councillor Carr. Councillor Bandway. Yes, Chair. I mean, Councillor Allen, I wish you'd just give up on this deficit lie. I mean, that's the first point I'd like to make. And if you want the evidence on that, we can provide you the evidence. I mean, the Conservatives have clearly stopped saying that now because they've seen information from their own party that that is a lie. The reality is, not I don't know if we've said it before, the deficit that this government inherited from Labour was actually smaller than the deficit that Labour inherited from the Conservatives in 1997. And I can provide you that information. So stop spinning this lie. I mean, clearly you've been deluded with some information that's clearly out of date. Uh, point so of order, Alan, Mr Mayor. I haven't spoken in this debate, so what, what's he talking about? I haven't made any comment on this debate so far, and he's now criticising what I've not said. Councillor Bannett. Councillor Allen, I do apologise. Clearly I had you in my mind for some reason. I, I, re I really don't know why. <laughs> Councillor Carr, I, I, that was Councillor Carr I was referring to. So anyway, but I'm sure Councillor Allen will forgive me for, for thinking about him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, look, let's get serious about this. And we do want cross-party support on this. You know, look, the out of date, you talked about, you talked about information being out of date. I could tell you about a bus, some of the casework I'm doing. The reality is, kids are going to go hungry tonight in our city. The reality is, the reality is there are people sitting, not putting their heating on in the winter. Now, that might not be happening in, I mean, I'm not a councillor in Micklover or Littleover or even Alice Street. And that's not to say it's not happening there. I'm not a councillor in those areas, so I'll leave it to those councillors to talk about the casework they're doing. I know for a fact, in Councillor Alison Martin, uh, Councillor Barbara Jackson, that represent parts of Bolton Ward, around the Benbridge Drive area, around the Allenton area, this is the kind of casework I'm dealing with. And do you know how depressing and demoralising and sad and how it's very difficult to go back to your, my nice warm house, my nice warm bed, look at my kid 
knowing that's got everything I can provide him, that he's going to go into a comfortable bed at night, be well fed, well looked after, knowing that I've been, I failed, Mr Mayor, in helping a family. Councillor Sarah Russell and I, we've regularly exchanged emails. And you know how dispiriting it is when you've tried everything within the powers you've got to do something and you can't help those people. Now, Councillor Carr, you said it was out of date. You've missed the point. You've missed, completely missed the point. We've got a motion about not you know, putting party politics aside. I can't think of a better issue. The human factor. If we care about residents in the city, and the reality is there are people suffering in our city, to not do anything to help them, I think that's just simply not acceptable, Chair. And this Labour administration has very pioneeringly tried to do that. And Councillor Carr, you know, you've tried to take credit for some of that. When we talked about, you know, the energy switching scheme, what did you say? Well, we think it's great. We were going to do that anyway. You know, uh, we've done it, but that's fine. You know, you clearly you recognise that energy switching and providing people a, a fair deal in terms of their utility bills is the right thing to do for them, for household families, because they're under pressure. And that was the premise that we put to Cabinet, which your leader uh, was boasting about. Yes, we think it's a great idea. Thank you very much. We, we wanted to do it as well. We were planning to do it. So the reality is, let's get down to the human factor here. There are people suffering in our city right now. We've got to do what's right for them. And I think it's only right the strong should support this city. We are a diverse city. Not in many ways. And we're also diverse in wealth, the, in the distribution of wealth. This administration made a decision in a symbolic way to redistribute devolved funding. And that was outcry. Outcry from the Alistair councillors. Thinking, how dare you do that? To devolve funding to some of the poorest communities in our city. So I hope you're not saying now that actually we shouldn't be helping kids that are starving. Now think about that. Children will go hungry tonight in Allington. But all they care about is bins. I don't see them outcry about kids starving in our city. What they do care about is bins. Now, I think the people of Derby are much more intelligent than Councillor Hickson, thank God, because they know, uh, and the elections will show that, the choice will be very simple. What do you care about? Do you care about in protecting the most vulnerable people in our society? And that's the choice between us. That's what we stand for. You stand for a, bra a brown bin. They stand for a brown bin. You've made that clear. So let's just get back to basics what this is about. It's about helping that child that I've had to say no to because I haven't got the powers, I can't restore the benefits which you, your parties and your governments have cut. Well, we are there, that's out of our control. But what we can do is, in our way, to work together to do something here in our city. And if it does mean the strong supporting the needy, one of the ideas that policies that Councillor, uh, Councillor Russell has not put in here, but one of the policies she's kind of what left it open for me to talk about, is the cooperative model in a concept called community buyback, which is happening in other parts of the country. Well, we will want to go to communities, the affluent communities, and Councillor Carr, you look completely disinterested, so clearly you've made up your mind that you don't care about the kids in Allington, but I care about the kids in Allington, Councillor Carr. So what we're saying is in Alice Street, in Littleover and Micklover, and in Blagreys, where I you know, spent 10 years of life where my parents live, and they are affluent, I'm proud to say, because they've worked hard all, they've worked hard all their lives, let the strong support the needy. Let the strong support the needy, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Barnett. So we are looking Councilor for Bandwick. cooperatives, which Councilor I hope Bandwick. that you will be able to use up your time. <laughs> Councillor Rawson, could you could you uh, sum up? Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Rawson. <Russell>. Sorry. <laughs> Um, just in response to the Liberal Democrats' Sorry. contributions, which are always um, delightful as ever, Councillor Carr, um, whether you use RPI or CPI, whatever rates of interest you want to lose, the picture is still bad. You've got to walk through the streets of Derby to look and see kids going hungry, not being washed clothed properly, not able to get to school on time because they live in families where they can't afford to feed them and get up out of bed in the morning and get them into school. These are serious issues that you might not be able to address, but really mean a lot to me, and I know they mean a lot to the other people in the city of Derby as well. And Councillor Ashburn, I'm not really sure what his contribution was, but there was something in there about unemployment figures, I think. Um, yeah, the unemployment figures have come down, but let's not pretend that these are secure full-time jobs. These are part-time jobs, unsecured jobs, contractual hours, zero hours contracts. Poverty is going up. People haven't got sustainable, secure employment. We need to change that. The government needs to change that. We need to take action now to stop poverty spiralling even further. Because I tell you what, on your head be it. 
and on your government's head be it. And if you want to speak to somebody about this issue, I suggest you speak to Ed Davey, who's not interested in eradicating fuel poverty anymore, even though it's a pertinent issue. And I dread to think how many OAPs are going to die this winter as a result of fuel poverty, which your coalition government doesn't want to address, and your minister clearly doesn't want to address by amending the energy bill. You should be ashamed of that, and you need to talk to him. On the overall issue, we need, we need action, and I would call on everyone in this chamber, if you really care about people in this city, if you really care that kids are going hungry, families are going cold, OAPs can't turn their heating on because they're scared they can't pay their energy bills, join with us, support our motion, and let's call on the government to take some action. I am going to put the motion to vote. Those for the motion... Those against? It's carried. Our fourth motion is proposed by Councillor Higginbottom and seconded by Councillor Skelton. Councillor Higginbottom. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'll, I'll quote um, a Facebook message I got this evening. It's time for consideration in debate and decision making. Bickering makes fools of all politicians and distances them from an increasingly non-voting public. We ask employees in all departments to work differently. We've got to implement cuts. Let us lead by example. Let us do things differently and cut the amount of time that we spend in this chamber talking nonsense, quite frankly. We teach children do you mean speak for yourself? We teach children <laughs> that bullying and personal attack is wrong. Some of the comments made in this chamber are tantamount to bullying. Let's lead by example. I urge you all to support this straightforward motion. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Councillor Skelton, do you wish to speak at this stage? I reserve my right, Mr Mayor, thank you. Councillor Hickson. Uh, yes, Mr Mayor, I wish to move an amendment which I've given to the... Uh, monitoring officer. Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Reserve my right to speak. The amendment that we've, re the amendment that we've received um, deletes the words after city. Therefore, the amended motion would read The Council agrees that its collective role is to work on behalf of the citizens of Derby to achieve the best results for the city. Council does, however, recognise and acknowledge that the democratic process relies on robust debate, but reaffirms that such debate should be within the terms of the Council's constitution, the Members' Code of Conduct, and rulings of the Mayor and Chairs where appropriate. Thank you. Councillor Hickson. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. I've had to um, tidy up this motion. I think its heart was in the right place, but it was naive and somewhat woolly in its, uh, in its context. Look, we need to get real, don't we, about what happens in this Council chamber. There's going to be a party in power, or two parties in power, and there's going to be a party in opposition. Um, and robust challenge and debate is absolutely essential. I don't even mind hearing from Councillor Banwake from, uh, from time to time. And we've had some, and we've had some, we've had some very colourful characters uh, in this chamber in the 20 odd years that I've been a member, and they've all added uh, something unique to the debates that we've had, because I think. Uh, for all of the members who have sat in this chamber in one way or another, they've been passionate about wanting to represent the people that they've stood for election for. They've been convinced that what they say is right, and they've been prepared to argue that in debates robustly at times to get that point of view over. I don't want to be in a council chamber where we've got 51 homogenised councillors uh, sitting in a homogenised uh, council chamber that's something akin to without any disrespect to knitting circles, to a knitting circle. Um, I, think that we, I think that we need the cut and thrust of politics, and we need it because whoever's in administration needs to be challenged, and the executive needs to be challenged, and sometimes that's done in strong terms, but we need to have uh, a framework where we've got rules in place, and we've got very strict rules in place. We've got a council constitution that says what the standing orders are and how this council should operate, and we've got a member's code of conduct that says how far we're to go. 
and sometimes some people, I might be one of them, step outside uh, that from time to time and, uh, and we get our knuckles wrapped accordingly. But it adds to the colour and it adds to the passion and it adds to the reality of the debate. And I don't think we want to lose that. And I think we would be doing a disservice to our electors and the city as a whole if they didn't see us uh, passionately arguing and fighting for what we believe in and doing things that, uh, that are important for the city. And sometimes we'll agree and sometimes we disagree. Nothing wrong with that. It's all part of the cut and thrust of political debate. This motion, as it was originally worded, would try and woolify that. It tries to, uh, modern, it tries to dumb down uh, the way that we behave in that chamber. I don't think that's the way that politics ought to operate. And that's why I've moved the uh, amendment as printed, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hickson. Councillor Bayliss. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I mean, the original motion suggests that councillors do not co conduct themselves responsibly, honestly, and with integrity, when in fact they do. The original motion, in my opinion, Mr. Mayor, is vacuous. You, Mr. Mayor, determine the passion, the tempo of debate, and the contributions to it. Even when people have recited the red flag to those who have shamed to jump ship from the Labour Party, the Mayor controlled the debate. We have, Mr. Baer has already pointed out, the Standards Board, rules of debate, the Constitution, and you, of course, Mr. Mayor, to arbitrate. The original, mo uh, original motion was pointless and even passed will be meaningless. It would rely on the office of the Mayor to resolve the issues in, of debate in the Chamber, which you already do. And as such, we will be supporting the amendment. We don't need guidance on principles from the proposer of the original motion. We know our duty and our responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I've had no indication from anybody else that they wish to speak on the amendment, so I'm going to put the motion as amended for the vote. Those for the motion as amended. Well, that's carried. Now we return back to the original motion, substantive motion, as amended. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to speak on the substantive motion? Councillor Higginbottom. Hmm? Vacuous it was not. We've all been in the chamber when people have got out of control, and I admit to probably having done it myself. Now is the time to change. We need to engage the public in politics, and the arguing and what we pretend to be passion is what puts people off, I'm afraid. And we can say forever, it's just politics. It's just theatre. If you want to offer theatre pe to people, give them tickets and give them a choice. But what we do in council chamber needs to change. It is not businesslike. And we know that bickering is what I mean. And I don't mean debate because, as I said before, I've seen six formers debate better than this chamber. Thank you, Ms. Councillor Skelton, do you wish to speak before I put the motion to the vote? No. Move to the vote, Mr. Mayor. CP 60B. Those for the motion as amended. Please show your hand. As carried, unanimous. Thank you very much. This concludes our business for this evening. Can I take this opportunity? and wish fellow councillors, officers present, and members of the public in the gallery and watching on the webcast a happy Christmas and a peaceful New Year. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas.